Living longer, living healthier, living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. Coping with the death of a life partner can be one of the most heart-wrenching journeys we face in life. And all too often, while struggling through waves of sadness, the reality of finances and legal tasks can make the grieving process even more difficult. Today, we'll talk about how to cope with the death of your loved one, and we'll learn about some legal and financial tips you should be aware of. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life, a show dedicated to helping you do just that. I'm Janet Whitmoyer, your host. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We are first going to discuss how to cope with the death of a loved one. Joining us today is Paul Goodman of Frontier Home Health and Hospice. Thanks for coming to the show, Paul. Glad to be here. So the first thing I wanted to talk about are what are some of the normal feelings that people would have after losing a spouse or a partner? Oh, some intense shock is gonna be involved. Uh, fear of being alone, uh, anger often comes in with that too. So okay. a lot of feelings. Okay, yeah. and when you talk about like the anger and the fear, um, I understand there are the stages of the grieving process. Can you explain a little bit about what that is for all of sure. us? Yeah, there's been uh, five stages that have been uh, identified that I, I truly believe uh, people do uh, pass through, maybe not all in the same way by any means, but may pass through them several times. Uh, first one being denial. And that is a very strong, strong defense mechanism that we almost subconsciously uh, deal with, uh, with the loss of a loved one. It's that first shock mm -hmm. and just that almost denying of reality uh, that it happened. Maybe even it is the uh, first understanding of a terminal illness. And so a very strong stage. Okay. Um, and then secondly, anger can follow that as the reality of the, the death or the terminal illness uh, diagnosis, we can displace, and it's, it's another defense mechanism our body uses, but uh, it can be displaced almost anywhere, to a friend, to a family member, to actually the person that has passed. Mm. Um, why are you leaving me alone? Um, but a st another stage that is very common. Um, and then the third stage, as that reality sets in uh, even more so, we can, we can go to a stage of even bargaining uh, bargaining with ourself. We can ask a lot of the if, if only questions. Mm -hmm. uh, if only uh, we got to the doctor quicker. Mm -hmm. If only uh, the doctor diagnosed it quicker. Um, and, and also it can be almost that secret pact with a higher power. Um, you know, if, if I do this, can I spend a little more time with my loved one? Mm -hmm. And so that can be very real. Um, and then there's a stage uh, which most go through, uh, which is depression. Yeah. And, and it, can be, it can be very intense or it can be lighter, but typically it is the pulling away and trying to organize what has happened. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a person has to be careful with, with how intense that can be for each person, but uh, it's very significant and, and it can be uh, it can be prolonged or it can be, be shorter. Some don't go through it, but most will. Okay. And then finally, uh, there is the acceptance phase. And if a person's lucky enough to get to the acceptance mm -hmm. phase, it's kind of a gift. Um, it isn't, it isn't um, many will not get past anger, uh, bargaining, but if they do get to the acceptance phase, uh, I'd like to call it even more of a reorganization of someone's life. Mm -hmm. Uh, to move forward, to step forward again. Oh, so those are the phases. Way. Great way to explain that. And is it true that people could bounce back and forth between the stages and it may not go one, two, three, four, five, but Absolutely. could go back and forth? Absolutely, it's, so. it's not always linear. Okay. And uh, it, there's no right or wrong. Okay. It's just uh, each individual and, and how hard they're grieving. Absolutely, okay. and how much support they may have. Oh, and that's a very, very good point. So when you said people are different, how about men and women? Do women mourn differently than men do? I truly believe they do. Uh, in, in generalities, uh, women often are a little more emotionally based. Uh, they, 
uh, they're more able usually to reach out to friends, to reach out to loved ones, and to be able to grieve openly, crying uh, uh, with someone on their shoulder, whereas a man will more than often, and I do believe this is starting to change a little bit, but I do believe they're, they're in more protection mode of the family and themselves. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to grieve probably a little bit more privately, uh, internalize things a little bit more, because they've learned to do so. and. Um, so yes, I believe there is a big difference. So knowing that, what advice would you have for people? What, what can they do to help get themselves through the grieving process? Right. I think reaching out to friends uh, is, is big, but, but taking the time, taking, taking the time to just go ahead and, and uh, uh, not rush things. Mm -hmm. Take the time to heal uh, first. And that, that can be with friends, that can be with your supports. Um, but, uh, but also good self-care is huge during that time. Okay. It's uh, a everything from appetite to continue to exercise and, and doing things that may not feel normal during that stage, but you push yourself to do so. Okay. So once you've gotten to the point where you can take care of yourself, probably one of the next things is starting to go through your loved one's personal belongings and, and that kind of thing, <laughs> right. and that's difficult. Again, what advice could you give people when they're going through that process? You bet. I, I think not to rush that. Um, dispersing an estate uh, can feel like you have to get after it very fast, but being very careful, reaching out to relatives, reaching out to, to loved ones that may have a, a one piece that is important to them, or a grandkid that could take one momento and, and uh, it'll mean everything for closure for that grandkid. Um, don't, don't rush it, I guess would be my advice. Okay. And I have one more quick question for you. I know you brought up the depression piece. What do you think people should do or how can they seek help if they feel like they are being depressed? Yes, I think watching how depression, uh, it, it, it can sneak up on us, mm -hmm. and especially with grief. And if it feels prolonged, if it is interrupting multifacets of your, your day, of your work environment, your home environment, and, and for continued long periods of time, that it is, there's no shame in reaching out to a primary doctor uh, that you may have and looking for a referral uh, for uh, counseling and, and not being afraid to reach out even to a hospice agency to social worker and they can give good local uh, references for counseling, absolutely. Okay, this has been really great information, Paul, and I wanna thank you for coming in and sharing with us. It's good to be here. Unfortunately, grief is just one part of dealing with such a tough situation. Stay tuned to learn some tips on legal issues that may come up when you lose a loved one and how to handle them. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining us now is attorney Alice Hinshaw, who's going to talk about some legal documents and what you should know when you lose a spouse or partner. Thanks for being on our show, Alice. Thank you, thank you for asking. Sure, so let's start off with what you should do first when you lose a spouse or a partner. Well, I know that you've had other segments on family and grieving and mm -hmm. so on, but I always say the first thing that you should do is take care of yourself and your family. Then you are going to be uh, focused on gathering information and documents. Okay, so what type of documents would you suggest need to be gathered? The first things uh, that you should be looking for are something called a letter of last instruction, a will, a trust, um, documents are, that indicate the wishes of the deceased. Okay, starting with the letter of last instruction, can you tell us a little bit about what that document is? Sure, it's, it's not always a letter. It's actually a written, written notes or a document stating some of the wishes of the decedent that aren't necessarily in the will or the trust. For example, um, uh, whether they want to be cremated or have a regular burial, mm. graveside burial, and other things, um, the type of service they want, if they want a service, possibly people that they want to have contacted if something happens to them. Oh, okay, that's great information that 
probably as easy to forget yes. as that time. Yes. Okay, you also mentioned the death certificate, and I can imagine that's an important document. Can you tell us why? The death certificate is an official uh, document that talks about or, or shows the time of death, the cause of death, and vital statistics. Mm -hmm. And that document is important because it is provided to authorities and organizations um, for like life insurance companies and to banks and so on okay. to provide vital information. Okay, so where would somebody be able to get a, the death certificate and mm -hmm. with so many people needing it, would you need multiple copies of that? Generally, a services provider, the funeral home or someone else uh, provides one to start okay. with and the uh, family then probably should gather maybe five or six of them and you can get those through the uh, Department of Human Services and I believe in Wyoming it's the same thing as the Department of Family Services. Okay. And, um, and you can also go back to the health services or the death services provider and ask. Okay, great. Another document um, is the will. Of course, yes. we've all heard about wills. What is a will and why is this such an important legal document? The will essentially uh, provides information about who will handle the estate, the assets. So the estate uh, is comprised of the assets of the individual. Mm -hmm. So the will names the person to handle the assets and it also uh, gives direction as to who will receive those assets. Okay. And then there's a couple other documents that most of us may not really be familiar with them. One is a trust. Can you tell us what a trust is? A trust is a is an entity, is a, uh, a trust document, is the document that sets up a, a place for assets to be placed before or after death. So a trust can be formed before death or after, and it's a place to uh, gather and collect assets. Okay, and then what is a probate? A probate is a court proceeding. Oh. And so uh, generally, um, you may or may not have to do a probate, um, depending on how many assets there are okay. and whether a trust is involved. And this topic gets very big and a very, in a big hurry. But the probate is when the deceased um, personal representative or others mm -hmm. approach the court and ask the court to administer the estate. So okay. that's where uh, the personal representative goes and the court gives direction and has rules about distributing assets and closing an estate. Okay, so you said you may or may not need a probate. Mm -hmm. How would somebody know if they needed to have the probate? Well, th there are statutes and rules about how many assets you have to have to trigger a probate and so on. For the layperson, I say you check with an attorney. Okay. And even if you think that uh, an estate isn't necessary, uh, many things trigger, uh, or a probate, many things trigger the probate, like okay. having real estate that needs to be handled. Oh, okay. So how long does the probate period typically last? The shortest the probate can last is six months. Okay. So when the court appoints a personal representative, when you approach the court, then the soonest it can be closed is about six months. Okay. And you just said a personal representative. Mm -hmm. If someone is a personal representative, would they need an attorney um, to help them? They don't have to have an attorney, but I, whether they continue with one or not, I do recommend checking with one so that they okay. they know the rules. Okay. So if somebody doesn't have a will, um, does the court or who decides then who inherits all of the assets of the person who has passed? Each state has a uniform probate code, uniform estate code, and the statutes set out. If there's if there's no will and no rules provided by the deceased. The statutes talk about who gets what property, how much of it, and it, gets, it gives a list in order of who has rights. 
Okay. Well, you've given us a tremendous amount of information, and I would probably end this by saying if you have questions, it's probably a really good idea to, to contact an attorney to find out what you need to do. Would yes. that be adequate to say? It is. It's, okay. it's very important to find out at the get-go okay. what, what needs to be done, and then however much, much assistance you need, you can get. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Alice, for Thank this you. wonderful information. Thank you for having me. Losing a loved one is tough enough without worrying about money in the midst of it all. Up next, we'll talk about some of the financial aspects of losing a partner and what you can do at least to make that part a little bit easier. Stay tuned. Welcome back. With us now is Michelle Peterson, who is a certified financial planner. Thanks for joining us, Michelle. My pleasure. The first thing that I wanted to start off was um, asking you why it's a good idea for people to make lists um, of their assets and what kind of things should be on that list. Well, it is very important to have a list. Um, we okay. figure that this is a time when the family is grieving and if you can make it easy for the estate to be settled, they would appreciate it. Okay. So the list should, con uh, should contain a listing of all of your assets. Okay. Where are they? If you have money in a bank, what's the name of the bank? Uh, the phone number of the bank, um, any of the account numbers there, how is it titled? Is it in one person's name? Is it in uh, two people's name as joint tenants with right of survivorship? If there's a living trust, is it in the name of the living trust? Also, who are the beneficiaries, if there are any on the account? Um, that's really important. Um, typically, there are IRAs, your retirement accounts, insurance policies, annuities have beneficiaries but there are also a couple of other types of accounts that have beneficiaries. If you have money at a bank, they offer pay on death accounts, POD, and mm -hmm. you name beneficiaries. If you have a mutual fund or a brokerage account, they have the same thing and they're called transfer on death or TOD accounts. So having all of that information readily available for all of your assets uh, makes life much easier for um, your family. Wow, that's a lot of information. So if you have all this information, is it a good idea to have some type of a filing system or how should that be kept? Yes, a filing system helps. If you have one file for each individual investment asset that you have and all the pertinent information in those files, it's, it just makes life a lot easier. Okay, and then once you have all this information together, how would you best advise people to talk to their children or surviving family uh, about that information? Well, you should always talk to your spouse and okay. make them aware of what, of where the list is or where their files are. And if you're a surviving spouse, it's really important to get um, uh, your adult children involved in the um, process so they also are aware. If if this is not available and no one knows where your list is, it's very difficult to go through tax returns and try and figure out where the assets are. Okay. So when you have official documentations like a death certificate, it, is it important or why would it be important to have official names and that kind of information correct on that certificate? Well, this hits close to home uh, because I just went through this the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. um, my mom passed away the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. Her legal name, which was on the death certificate, is Mary Margaret, was Mary Margaret, and she always went by Margo. Oh. She had an annuity investment, and it was under Margo. Now, the insurance company would have paid the proceeds out to the beneficiaries if that was the only issue. However, mom always lied about her age. <laughs> She had about a 12-year <laughs> range of years that she used. So her birth year on the annuity contract and on the death certificate didn't match. The insurance company said, well, we'll take a driver's license. We had her driver's license. It had her legal name on there, but the birth year still didn't match the death certificate. Oh. So we had to get an attorney involved. Um, and you know, eventually the proceeds were paid out, but it, oh. it cost us money to hire an attorney. Wow. Okay, very important, correct? Yes. Legal name. Okay. Yes. So when it comes to bank accounts, how would someone go about closing a bank account uh, that your spouse or loved one had? Well, if it doesn't go through probate, any, anything that doesn't go through probate, um, contact that company. 
Um, each one will have their own form to fill out, and they're always going to want a certified copy of the death certificate. Okay. And then, speaking of debt, if, if a spouse or loved one has debt, how would somebody go about taking care of that? Well, if you don't know where the debt is or what okay. the debt is, um, you can always call one of the top three um, credit reporting agencies, Equifax, um, Experian, or TransUnion. They will also want a certified copy of the death certificate. Okay, and then what is the process for people closing out um, retirement accounts or IRAs or those types of accounts? Um, you know, it, it would be nice if they um, had a certified financial planner to guide them through this process and help them so they won't make mistakes in where they're placing the money afterwards. Um, each company where the IRA is or where your retirement, retirement plan is or pension is going to have their own form to fill out. And they're also going to want a certified copy of the death certificate. Okay. And so um, following up on that a little bit, uh, for a living spouse who might have been um, depending on their, their, other, their spouse's planning for retirement, how would they go about doing that now on their own? Well, whenever you have a major change in your life, and the death of a spouse is a major change, mm -hmm. it's always a good time to look at what are your goals now? What is it you want to do? And are your investments, are your assets um, helping you accomplish those goals? Okay. Well, Al, this has been great information. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, and I would like to thank all of our guests for joining us to talk about a tough situation. And thank you for tuning in today. Until next week, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the YouTube icon. Special thanks to Fire Tower Coffee House and Roasters. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.